I was standing at 28,800 feet, high on Mount Everest, and my legs were sore, my back was sore, the wind was swirling up, there was 20 mile an hour winds cutting across, totally fatigued, totally tired, not wanting to go on because of the challenge. I remember looking down to my right, seeing an 8,000 foot drop and a 10,000 foot drop on my left. And then I looked out onto the ridge and this guy was shouting back across the ridge saying, it's Martin, it's Martin, I'm blind. And it was one of our teammates, Martin. And he almost stepped off the ridge and pulled us right off the mountain. Um, and if he had a stepped off that ridge, I'm not sure I would have been sitting here right now. When I was nine years old, I went on a scripture union camp. It was a Bible camp that my parents sent me on, uh, probably because I was stealing and being a bully and uh, doing all the things that a, a kid possibly does but shouldn't be doing. And my parents tried to, tried to ma <laughs> manage me and uh, I was not interested in anything to do with anything. Uh, they used to drag me to church. I didn't really feel it was relevant. Uh, to me in any way, shape or form. But I was, I, I remember being sitting at the back of the room, we were throwing stuff at other people. The guy at the front said, you know, stop what you're doing. He picked me out of the crowd, at the back of the crowd. And he said, come here. And I remember my heart just dropped and I was like, I'm not getting up. I'm not going anywhere near the front. And literally I just stepped up out of the seat. I would never have done that before. It would not be like that. I stepped up out of the seat. I walked to the front of the room. The guy just prayed for me and, and said, Jesus wants you to follow him. And I remember just breaking down in tears. I broke down in tears and I sat in the corner and my life was changed from one moment. It really was a moment that um, brought me to him. And I remember that I was sitting on the floor, my eyes were closed, I was a nine-year-old kid. The only words I heard was, follow me. Just come and follow me. I'm originally from Ireland, uh, just outside Dublin. I'd never been exposed to anything outside of my own little world. You know, I struggled with life, you know, as all teenagers do with everything. I didn't, confidence, looks. It was, it was um, a, a challenge to figure out who I was, what I was doing. I needed to experience something different and I just thought my way would be better. I was always brought back though to that calling um, to follow him and he was like follow me follow me when I realized in my kind of when I was about 23 24 that I needed to follow him things started to start clicking again all I wanted to do was climb mountains and um, be outdoors and hike through the woods and uh, climb rock faces and climb big mountains and he used that and I ended up with Everest on my mind Mount Everest sits at 29,035 feet, the highest point on the planet. Hundreds of people have gone there to climb and, and not come home. Every time you step above 18,500 feet on Everest, you enter a realm that is known as the lower realm of the dead zone. Above 26,000 feet, you enter the higher realm of the dead zone. Nothing survives, nothing lives. Being in that environment can kill you at any moment. People hike into Everest Base Camp and then spend six or seven weeks climbing the mountain. A massive challenge, highly dangerous, highly rewarding, and somewhere you would need to tread lightly if you're ever thinking of climbing it. Yeah, I wanted to climb Everest really to prove to myself that I was good enough. I think I've been told pretty much my whole life that I wasn't good enough by whether it was teachers or people I came across, whether it was football team or just people told me I wasn't good enough. Even. Two months before I went to climb Everest, two professionals told me I wasn't good enough for Everest. And I had to go. I had to go to that mountain. I had to climb it. At that particular moment in time in my life, in my mid-20s too, I was introduced to a charity called Fields of Life. And their, their goal is to share the Christian faith in the poorest of communities through education, through health and through water projects. I knew then as I developed kind of this idea of climbing Everest that I needed to do it for, for fields of life. My life from there turned into this sole goal of climbing Everest and that was what my life actually became about. I, I left where I was living, I moved back home with my parents and I said I'm going to climb Everest before I turn 30 and be part of a, I think a unique group of only 300 people in the world that have ever climbed it in their, in their 20s. 
Two years later, we set out to climb four mountains and four continents in one year to raise the money to build a school for Fields of Life in, in Uganda. Um, unfortunately, when we went to do the third mountain, the guide that we had selected, after seeing us on the mountain, told us right after that trip, this is now January 2008, that you know our trip to Everest is cancelled, that we're, if we go to Everest, we're gonna die, and we're not good enough. And he pretty much told me that I wasn't good enough to climb Everest. Um, and this was two months before we were due to fly to Nepal to start the two month expedition to climb Everest. So I really didn't understand what was happening. And we had it committed to the charity, to the people in the village in Uganda that we're gonna do this. You know, it was probably one of the lowest moments of my life. Um, and I turned back to the only thing that I really knew that was, that was right. And I prayed about it. I talked, we, I talked through with my teammate, Graham. And we, we said, you know what, we're good enough. We had sourced another company that took us to Scotland, up in Ben Nevis, and got us climbing some faces, some challenging climbs. And they were like, yeah, you guys are ready to go. That was a month after being told we weren't good enough, and a month later we're on a flight to Kathmandu uh, to start the 72-day expedition to Everest. And uh, financially, I had no money, I went into debt. Um, I was risking my life as you step onto Everest and try and climb through hundreds of meters of ice fall, crashing down in the dark, avalanches, people dying around us, people dying in tents next to us. You know, you need to rely on yourself, but I needed to rely on, on my God, my faith, my ability. And he gave me that strength. Um, he gave me that strength to go to the mountain. He gave me that strength to climb the mountain. He continually watched over me the whole way up and down the mountain. Any time that I would wane, I was given strength. I pushed past all of those obstacles to get, you know, in an environment where there's 30% oxygen levels, my back was sore, my legs were sore, my whole body was sore, uh, trying to force myself up, up the side of Everest. Stepped onto the top and I remember just having a moment to myself and I'm, there was very few people there. Um, I just, I thank God for getting me there. Looking back, when I think about how I climbed the mountain, there's no way I, I did it on my own. I'm just an average guy. Um, when I came back from Everest, I decided to set up my own trekking company. And through the work that I do now, being able to bring people to Everest, to see Everest, to, to experience the mountains and sp to experience God's creation, I'm able to help the work and further the work of Fields of Life. And that's what these big challenges can do. And that's what Everest can do. It can open doors to people that don't necessarily want to listen to, to what I think uh, their life should be in, in, in following Christ. But Everest lets me in the door. Uh, and I have been given the privilege to speak all over the world uh, and share that message. When I think back on where I've come from and how I'm sitting, here. God has used me in ways I never fully understand or am supposed to. How could I have ever known that it would directly affect hundreds and thousands of other people's lives for the better? That I could be used to climb that mountain to go on to do the things that I'm doing now or to support the work of, of a charity or to see children um, educated in a school. To understand nature, to understand our creation, to be in a place where the Bible tells us that you turn a rock and He is there. He is everywhere. And everywhere I go, whether it's walking through the mountains of Colorado, the Himalayas, Kilimanjaro, wherever it may be, I see Him in everything. I see Him in creation. I see that there's no way that the earth wasn't created by Him. There's, there's a Creator and it's hard to even describe. It's hard to even put words to what that feels like, but when you, when you feel it, you know what it is. That's the learning I take away from, from being in, in the mountains or walking up the side of a hill, no matter where it is. To be able to experience nature and to experience God in these places is truly amazing. That doesn't mean that that's going to be your journey or your place to find Him. All I'm saying is be open and listen. 
only when I follow do I really see and understand what's important. Wherever you're being led, uh, don't say no. Uh, we don't know what's out there, we don't know what's around the corner, but in him, everything is possible. My name is Ian Taylor, this is The Truth, and I dare you to go and live it.